Hello, story time, real quick. I, I got this email pretty recently. It wasn't from a company, it was just from a guy. This guy named Angus, he lives in the UK, and he said, David, I really want you to check out my product. And usually I would ignore that, except that it is this. It is a 3D printed, ultra panoramic, medium slash large format film camera, which if you know me, is extremely in my wheelhouse because I waste a lot of money on film, I have a lot of panoramic, film cameras, but I've never shot like 120 large format panoramic. It also uses an iPhone as a viewfinder. So like this is definitely, definitely, definitely in my wheelhouse. So I emailed Angus, he sent it over, it got here in like two days. And now I wanna talk to you guys about it because this thing is really interesting. Okay, so this camera is something that I would basically call a camera obscura. That's pretty much anything that has a lens on the front and something to capture that light that's going through the lens on. But to understand how camera obscuras work, I just wanna break something really foundational to photography down to you guys real quick. And that's called the exposure triangle. Now when you're taking a photo, there are three main things that you need to think about. And that's aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. So the aperture is a ratio between the focal length of the lens and the diameter of the hole they're actually gathering light in. And all you really need to know is that the wider the aperture, both the more light that you're gonna get through your lens and the more depth of field you're gonna get, that separation between the subject and the background. And remember, it's a ratio. So something like f1.4 is gonna be more light and a wider depth of field than f4. The ISO or sensitivity of that camera, in this case on film, is dictated by the physical size of the silver halide crystals on that film. I know that sounds really weird and really insane, but literally film is just a gelatin that has a bunch of silver halide crystals on it. And if you've got a higher or faster film speed, that means you've got bigger silver halide crystals. So naturally, you would have a more grainy image because you've got bigger grains of those silver halide crystals. So that would mean if I was shooting like ISO 200 film versus ISO 400 film. It's dictated by the film itself. The camera, the camera obscura, doesn't need to worry about that. In a digital camera, that's dictated by something called the signal to noise ratio. And it's not exactly grain, it's just noise, but it's basically the same thing. I don't really wanna get into that here, but I do have a video on my personal channel that goes really deep into that, so you can always watch that later. Okay, and the last part of the exposure triangle is shutter speed. But basically what it means is the amount of time that the shutter or aperture is open for. So one over 125th is twice as fast as one over 60. So if I were to shoot an image at one over 125, I would get an image that's half as bright as the one over 60 image. So these three elements of the exposure triangle kind of are in conversation with each other. And it's basically what dictates the look of a photo, like the exposure, the depth of field, the blurriness. And if you understand how they affect each other, you can start getting more creative with your photography and start making intentional decisions instead of just hitting the auto button. If you're looking to get into photography, the number one piece of advice that I usually give people is to just shoot manual and understand these things really well. Plus it lets you make and understand weird cameras like this. So I wanna get into how Angus actually made this thing. The actual camera itself, it's just a big box that holds a bunch of film. So we're gonna spool the film right across here, but obviously, there's a problem, right? We don't have a viewfinder. On old like box cameras, four by fives like I've got here, you would use something called ground glass, which is basically this frosted piece of glass that the light comes through the lens, projects onto the back, and then you've got this upside down image of what you're trying to take a photo of. You can still find this kind of viewfinder on things like some 35 millimeter cameras and some medium format cameras. You've probably seen videos like this on like TikTok or Instagram reels. But on the 6x17 camera here, you gotta load the film roll before you take all the shots, which is a little bit more of a problem. So Angus developed a way to get around this, which is pretty interesting. Before you even load the film, if you know the shot that you wanna take, you can open up the camera and stick this makeshift ground glass on the back of the camera. It's magnetically attached and you can look through it and kind of get a sense of what you're taking. But the problem is that that's only gonna be for the very first photo, right? You use that to frame your shot, and then you can focus if you really want to, though I'd recommend shooting at infinity. Then you load your film, you close it up, and you take your shot. But for the three other frames that you're taking, you're not gonna be able to use that ground glass at all. So Angus had a really good solution, and it's this app called Viewfinder. 
Now this is the other part of where I think makes this camera really interesting, right? Because you're not only 3D printing a literal medium format film camera, you're also using a phone to be able to view the images that you're about to take. So on this viewfinder app, you can tell it the format of the film you're shooting. In this case, it's six by 17. You tell it the focal length of the lens that you're using. In this case, it's a large format 90 millimeter, and it's got a light meter built in which is pretty awesome because it can allow you to know exactly what settings that you should set on the lens itself for the film speed that you're shooting. Now, Angus really thought about everything because this phone mount magnetically attaches to the top of the 6x17 camera. It's really awesome. It just slides up here. You can slide your phone in and basically see what you're shooting. This app also has this like gallery of every photo that you've ever taken on the film camera. So you can have a reference photo from your phone of the images that you've taken. I, I just think it's really well designed. So now that you effectively know how this thing works, I'm gonna go to a few different locations to shoot this. I'm gonna go down to Dumbo to shoot the Brooklyn Bridge, and I'm also going to take a little trip to Iceland. Um, and I'm trying to get some photos out there, see how this thing works. I'll come back and give you my thoughts on it. We're gonna talk about it. All right, we are back from some testing of this camera. Uh, so let's talk really quick about what I shot. All right, uh, so first of all, the shot of the Brooklyn Bridge came out pretty cool, right? Um, it was a little bit weird though. I didn't really know what was going on here. There's all these lights that are kind of like swirling into each other. And at first I thought, you know, uh, maybe I messed something up. Maybe I left the shutter open longer than I thought or something like that. Didn't really think too much of it. Um, but it does give a really cool effect, and honestly, I'm probably going to post this anyway. Sometimes, that's just the magic of film. You don't really know what you're gonna get, and then you get it back, and you're like, eh, pretty cool. Then, here's some Iceland photos. So, this first Iceland photo, awesome. Mostly came out pretty cool. Uh, the colors are amazing, the detail is there. I mean, look at that 6x17 medium format. That is so sick. You can just zoom in forever, and there's all of this detail. Love that. Uh, I did notice that there is a little bit of light bleed on the left and right sides of this image. And I assumed that that was just kind of natural. You know, maybe it's a 3D printed camera. Like maybe there was not perfect light sealing on the sides of the camera or something like that. That's just kind of how it goes sometimes. Uh, this photo that I took with Provia looks freaking amazing. It does have a little bit of vignetting. That's both because of the natural image that we took over in Iceland and also because Provia tends to do that. There's also the idea that this lens maybe doesn't cover the entire image circle of this 6x17 camera. Little natural vignetting, totally normal. That happens on my Fujifilm TX1 as well because those medium format lenses are pretty big, but they're not always perfectly big. This photo of the River Delta pretty much looks perfect. There's a lot of good photos that I got from Iceland here, but uh, I did start to notice some weird stuff when I got my film back. There were a lot of photos that I took out there that I thought were going to be amazing, right? Like I took it on my regular camera, I took it on my phone and I was so excited. And then I get them back and they look like this. So I get an email from Angus and he's asking me how the photos are coming out. And I tell him, you know, some of them came out really perfect basically. And then some of them had these light leak issues and some of them got like totally destroyed. And I asked him if he'd seen that issue in any of the other photos that he shot. So he did a little investigating and it turns out 3D printing cameras is kind of hard. So basically what happened here is that Angus is using a bunch of different industrial 3D printers to print these cameras, right? And uh, it turns out when you use a 3D printer, you have to select a filament density. Most of these 3D printers were set to the exact same filament density, but one of them was sent a little bit lower. And that's a problem because film is super photosensitive to light. And if you don't have the density of your plastic thick enough, then you're gonna get some light leaks. So if you put the film in and you shoot it right away, you aren't exposed to a ton of harsh sunlight, the images are still gonna look pretty good because the sun hasn't really penetrated that plastic. But if you say like, put your film in, take a shot, move on to the next location, try to get your framing right, then take the shot, you're gonna get um, pretty messed up film and pretty much end up with what I have here. So Angus obviously wasn't very happy with this. So he did what any good businessman would do and he shipped me another camera. This also came in like two days. I don't know how he does it from the UK, but yeah. So let's just burst that open. 
Oh boy. David, please close the knife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So now I've got this brand new camera. Basically just have to move the lens from the original one to this one. And hopefully the density of the filament is thick enough. Gonna go on the Pacific Northwest road trip with a few other film photography YouTubers, see how it performs, come back, and hopefully 100% of the images are pretty good. So here we go one more time. Half second. Okay, that's one. Right, we are back. Um, as you can see, no problems in this one. This came out way better. All my images came out really sharp thanks to Hidden Light over in Arizona for scanning and developing all of my film because I sent them a lot, but those scans are amazing, so give them a look if you have a chance. Um, and thanks to Angus for sending me this. Now, Angus is selling these. They're about a thousand pounds, which is pretty expensive, but you do have to consider like all of the R&D that goes into something like this, right? Overall, I mean, 3D printing something is easy, but having the know-how to actually make a camera obscura, not so easy. But I mean, what this does really make me interested in is just making my own camera obscura in like a different format, right? That's the cool thing about these camera obscuras. If you can project the light into a certain shape, you can basically make a camera out of it. There's a lot of files that are already available online that you can just print yourself for like a small fee or even for free. But I kind of just want to make my own design and see how that turns out. So maybe we'll try that out. Anyway, thanks for checking this out. Check out uh, Angus's website for all of his different cameras. And if you've got any more questions about this kind of stuff, let me know in the comment section below. We're going to be doing more photography videos on this channel eventually. I think I've got something coming up in the next couple months. But either way, that's been it. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace. <laughs> Is that too Marquez? <laughs>